Hi everybody, Zomato went IPO on 14th of July 2021. And while most of us only know Zomato as a food delivery startup, which is losing hundreds of crores with each passing quarter, very few of us know how exactly is Zomato going to become profitable. But you know what guys, in the past two years, Zomato has made some critical investment that can turn it into a profitable company. The best part is that the profits of this investment will be immediately visible within the next two to three years itself. This strategic investment that I'm talking about is none other than Zomato Hyperpure, which is a B2B supplier business. And Zomato is so keen on conquering this market that they'll be investing 372 crores into Hyperpure to build giant warehouses, including a 30,000 square feet warehouse in Bangalore. Apart from that, they intend to scale the business to more than 18 cities in the next few years and expect a growth of 1000% in the next two to three years. The question is, what exactly is Zomato Hyperpure? Why is Zomato so keen on diversifying its business? And most importantly, as investors into the food tech space, what are the on-ground challenges that you need to keep an eye on to understand the food tech wars of India? This video is brought to you by Wind Wealth, but more on this at the end of the video. The first thing you need to understand is how do restaurants work in the first place? So here's an oversimplified example of the same. People, before the food is served to you on your table, the restaurant owner has to deal with a complex inventory management system. And based on the type of food that the restaurant serves, there are hundreds of ingredients that have to be stocked up so that the chef can prepare your food. Now the catch over here is that not all ingredients are available with a single vendor. For example, if a restaurant serves Indian food, just to make naan and paneer tikka masala, you need mustard oil, curd, turmeric, chili powder, dhania powder, jeera powder, garam masala, dry fenugreek leaves, chaat masala, ginger garlic paste, carom seeds, basin, lemon and salt. Similarly, for making chicken tikka masala, you need yogurt, lemon juice, cumin, cinnamon, pepper, ginger, salt, chicken breast, skewers, butter, garlic, pepper, paprika and sauces. Now each one of these ingredients again fall into different categories and that are grocery, dairy, vegetables, grains, fruits, bread, packed foods, spices and poultry. And apart from that, for the other dishes, you have seafoods, frozen foods and beverages. Usually, every type of these ingredients come from a different vendor. And in some cases, in order to keep the prices low, the restaurants even have two to three vendors for each category. And whoever offers a lower price at that time gets the order. This way, the number of vendors for a single restaurant might even go up to 200 vendors. Now another catch over here is that in this case, these middlemen or vendors of different categories become an essential part of the supply chain and they cannot be bypassed. Why? Because each one of these 100 to 200 ingredients have a different shelf life. For example, paneer and milk might last for 2 to 3 days. Different seafoods have different shelf lives. Packed foods have expiry dates ranging from 3 months to 1 year. Fruits and vegetables do not remain fresh after 2 to 3 days and so on and so forth. So regardless of how big the restaurant is, they cannot order these items in bulk and just store them. So restaurant owners have to order items in limited quantities in clearly defined cycles according to the usage, demand and shelf life of an ingredient. And all of this put together, depending on the size and type of the restaurant, the working capital for inventory alone could range between 1 lakh to 10 to 15 lakhs per month. And this is where Zomato Hyperpure comes in with something called the farm to fork model. And as the name implies, instead of restaurants having hundreds of vendors to source different ingredients, Zomato wants to become the one-stop shop for restaurant to order all categories of ingredients directly from the source. Now as simple as this sounds, it gives Zomato three impeccable superpowers over the existing suppliers. The first one is obviously the scale of Zomato. Now when it comes to individual suppliers, if a vendor makes 7 to 8% profit on a 1 lakh purchase, since Zomato places large orders, it can make 12 to 15% profit in the same 1 lakh sale. In fact, as per the 2020 report, Hyperpure has a minimum order value of 1500 rupees with gross margins of 10 to 12%. Secondly, contract farming could increase Zomato's profit margins. For those who don't know, contract farming is an arrangement wherein a company like Zomato could sign a contract with farmers for quality produce. For example, the company will make an advance payment to the farmers with the promise of procuring 
30 tons of tomatoes with a list of quality parameters. Now these parameters might even include the kind of pesticides the farmers are supposed to use and sometimes even the usage of a certain technology for irrigation and farming. And after the harvest, when the farmer delivers the produce, he is paid the full amount including an advance for the next cycle. Therefore, by using contract farming, Zomato can not just procure the produce at low cost but also make sure that the commodities are of the highest standards possible. This can further increase your profits by a large extent. And thirdly, unlike other suppliers, Zomato can give the hyper-pure tag to the restaurants that are listed in their application. And especially after the pandemic, the increased health and hygiene consciousness of the consumers is bound to drive more sales towards the hyper-pure partners. This is the reason why, in the past two years, Zomato has gone from supplying to just 2,256 restaurants in March 2020 to 12,000 restaurants as of June 2021. Now another point to be noted over here is that when Zomato has a large number of restaurants, it can even use machine learning to accurately predict demand and further optimize its inventory management system. And this could also be used by Zomato to enter the grocery and online retail market, eventually to enter into a competition with Geomart and the rest. This is the reason why Zomato is using Hyperpure as a core instrument to diversify its business and go from a door-to-door -door business model to a farm-to-fork business model. Apart from that, Zomato is aggressively diversifying into other domains by investing $75 million into Shiprocket, $50 million for 16% stake in Magicping, and it also sold Fitso to CureFit for $50 million and gained 6.4% stake in CureFit. Now what remains to be seen is how these companies work in conjunction to build an agile ecosystem for consumers. So moral of the story is that on paper, Zomato has all the elements needed to build a robust and profitable supply chain in the B2B space. It has a billion dollar investment, has millions of app users to direct traffic towards hyperpure partners, has massive warehouses to store and manage inventory, it has the technology to execute world-class inventory management system, and most importantly, it already has a positive unit economics with Hyperpure with the great potential to scale up. So the question over here is that, is it so obvious that Zomato will end up building a billion dollar business out of Hyperpure? And does it mean that you should blindly invest into Zomato? Well, not really, because as much as Hyperpure looks promising on paper, on ground, there are some critical challenges that Zomato needs to tackle if it wants to become a powerful player in the B2B space. And this brings me to the most important part of the episode and that is, as investors and students of business, what are the critical parameters that you need to keep an eye on to understand the success and failure of Zomato? And this framework is something that applies to every single player operating in the food tech space. Before we move on, I want to thank our partners of today's episode and that is Windwealth. People just like Zomato and Geo are diversifying their business, even you should diversify your investment strategically. Do not put all your money into just stocks and crypto and diversify your portfolio appropriately into different asset classes to reduce your risk. Now this does not mean you should start investing into FDs because it barely even beats inflation. This is where our partners Windwealth come in. Windwealth is a platform wherein you can invest in assets that lie between low risk low return assets like FDs and high risk high return assets like stocks. You can now directly invest into secured bonds directly issued by NBFCs. These instruments were earlier available only to HNIs, but now it is available to retail investors at a ticket size of just 10,000 rupees through Windwealth. For example, here's a new bond that will roll out on Windwealth by an NBFC called Ugro Capital. The tenure of this bond is 27 months and the principal is paid back every 9 months. The interest is paid monthly and this bond will give you a return of 10.5% XIRR. The best part about Wint is that they are focusing on educating the investors and not just selling it to them. So to know everything about this opportunity and other upcoming ones, click on the link in the description and press the keep me updated button to learn all about investing in bonds. Moving on to the challenges, here are the critical parameters that you need to keep an eye on to assess the success or failure of Zomato with Hyperpure. Firstly, just like Dmart, in order to establish a relationship with Hyperpure, the restaurant owners have to cut ties with their existing suppliers. And like we discussed before, this is a very big deal because we are talking about a relationship that has been fostered over decades. Secondly, according to a July 2021 article, Zomato has taken a misstep with the credit system of Hyperpure. 
It includes a clause that says Zomato can deduct from the restaurant's earnings on the food delivery side if the dues for hyperpay or purchases are not paid on time. And many restaurants find it unviable because with the local vendors, the credit could be extended up to 60 days without interest. Whereas Zomato actually levies an interest rate. For example, with credit period being 7 to 45 days, when timely payment on hyperpay or purchases does not happen, the company charges a monthly interest rate of 1% on the due amount for the first 15 days. After that, it charges a 0.1% daily interest from the date of invoice due until the debt closure. Now to some restaurant owners, this almost sounds like a debt trap. So when something like this pops up, on top of the hard time that the restaurant owners are already facing due to the pandemic, it's obviously a very very bad thing. And lastly, there is the Competition Commission of India which can bring in new regulations in case Zomato tries to control the market beyond a certain point. Nonetheless, as students of business, it will be very interesting to see how Zomato navigates through these challenges and eventually becomes a successful company. If it does, it will obviously become a goldmine investment and if it does not, it will teach us some very valuable lessons in business and supply chain management. And if you are a restaurant owner, please drop a comment about your experience with Zomato Hyperbure so that the entire community can benefit from your market insight. And who knows, the leaders of Zomato or some other startup might be reading your comment to bring some changes to their system. Before we say goodbye, I've got three study materials for you. Number one is the Ken's article on the farm to fork model of Zomato. Number two is a document that tells you all about the supply chain and distribution of tomatoes in India. It's a little old, but then I think it's great for your conceptual understanding. And lastly, if you want to keep an eye on specifically Zomato related news, you can use Ticker Tape's news section to understand the most relevant market updates about Zomato. And three more companies that I have in my watch list are Nestle, Borosil Renewables and Adani Power. So keep an eye on all these companies because their growth has some golden insights about the trajectories of the emerging markets in India. And do check out the Wind Wealth app from the link in the description. That's all from my side for today guys. If you learned something valuable, please make sure to hit the like button in order to make YouTube Baba happy. And for more such insightful business and political case studies, please subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next one. Bye bye.